Hello and welcome to this first session of pathophysiology and pharmacology. In today's session, we are going to consider the topic pharmacotherapeutics, and we are going to focus mainly on pharmacokinetics. In today's session, we will define some basic terms that is associated with the study of drugs and how they affect the body. We are going to list some properties of an ideal drug and we are going to identify some factors that affect the action of the drug. But first, let's take a look at some common terms. There are four basic terms that we have to consider when studying drugs and pharmacology. First of all, what is a drug? A drug is any chemical that can affect living processes. So any chemical that you can ingest into your body which will change the metabolism or change the physiology of the body process is considered a drug. Pharmacology is the study of drugs and their interactions with living systems. So living systems can be a living being such as an individual or even an animal. Clinical pharmacology, however, is the study of drugs in humans. Therapeutics is the use of drugs to diagnose, prevent, or treat a disease, or to prevent pregnancy. These terms will help you to follow what we are going to discuss and build on in later time. The question that has been asked quite often is, what are the characteristics or properties of an ideal drug? And for a drug to be ideal, the drug has to be effective, safe, and be selective. Effectiveness is the drug eliciting the response for which it was given. So for example, if I administer an antihypertensive, I expect that to decrease the blood pressure of the individual. If a drug is not effective, then it should not be used at all. A safe drug is one that cannot produce any harmful effects. So if I take a drug, if that drug is safe, then I should not experience any harmful effects. But there is no such thing as a safe drug because all drugs can cause harm. If taken in either therapeutic doses or even when taken in large doses. A selective drug is one that elicits the response for which it was given. So if I give a medication that is going to decrease blood pressure, if that medication is selective, then it should only decrease blood pressure and not affect any other physiological process. Once again, there is no such thing as a selective drug because all drugs can cause side effects. As we proceed in this course, you will learn that every medication or drug you take has side effects and this prevents it from being selective. There is also not a drug that has only one effect. As such, a drug can have multiple effects and for that matter, it can be used for many conditions or multiple conditions. There are many other properties that should be considered such as the cost, the chemical stability of the medication, the, productive, the predictability for the medication for its action, and also drug interactions. All these are very important when providers are trying to choose a drug that they will prescribe for an individual client. There are many factors that determine the intensity of drug responses. These factors include the dose, the route, and timing of administration. These are all important determinants of drug response. Because all patients are unique, drug therapy must also be tailored to each patient because we want the patient to benefit from that medication as much as they can. We will talk more about these characteristics 
when we begin talking about our pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and also individual responses to certain medications. The question is, therefore, why do nurses need to have a working knowledge about pharmacology? Why is this important? Nurses must be able to assess and monitor the effectiveness of a drug. And to do so, we need to understand how the drug works and how it affects the patient's physiological processes. If we don't know this, then there is no way that we are going to be able to critically assess whether a medication is therapeutic or not. And that is why this is included in your coursework. So for example, you have a patient who is 74 years old. Um, this patient is an African-American man and has had three blood pressure readings of 160 over 90 millimeters of mercury or higher on three separate occasions. This patient has been diagnosed with high blood pressure or hypertension. The family physician you are working with has prescribed lisinopril, 10 milligrams PO once a day. Now, as soon as you have to know what lisinopril is, how it affects physiological processes, so you'll be able to educate your patient and also monitor for the effectiveness of the drug. So as you answer these questions, below the case presentation. Know that the three most important characteristics that any drug can have are effectiveness, safety, and selectivity. Because if a drug is not effective, that is, if it doesn't do anything useful, then there is no justification of giving it. Also, if a drug is not safe, then it means it's going to cause harm to the patient and it's going to have side effects that are not intended or that we don't like, and so we shouldn't be using it. A selective drug is also defined as one that elicits only the response for which it is given. We have already learned that there is no such thing as a selective drug, but we want to make a drug as selective as possible so we can decrease the side effects. And so when we talk about properties, we should consider all these when we are selecting a medication for Mr. Jones. What property should be considered when selecting this medication for Mr. Jones? As I said, we have to know that this medication is going to work. That is the predictability. We also have to know whether this medication is reversible or not. And the ease of administration. Can this be taken by mouth? Do we have to inject it? Do we have to infuse it? Freedom from interactions such as, is this going to affect other medications that Mr. Jones is taking or not? And what is the cost? Will Mr. Jones be able to afford this medication or do we have to look for alternative? And is this chemically stable enough so that it's not going to lose effectiveness if this medication is stored? For example, when you go and you fill your prescriptions, these can last for a month or two months. You don't want the medications to disintegrate or to not be stable whilst they are in storage because that is going to reduce the effectiveness. And lastly, based on this case study, what variations might be considered when selecting a new medication for Mr. Jones? Well, we have to look at Mr. Jones, Jones's age, his ethnic background, and other variables such as is he compliant? Will he be able to take this medication as prescribed, his education level? There are characteristics that are unique to each patient, 
and this can influence the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic processes. And so we have to know and have a basic knowledge about our patient and the drug we are prescribing so we can give a good match between patient and medication. Now that we know what an ideal drug should be and the characteristics that we have to consider, let's begin talking about the processes a drug goes through before it achieves its intended action. And the first step of this is what is called pharmaceutic phase. So pharmaceutic phase is where the drug breaks down from solid form to tiny particles so it can be transported through the body. The two processes in this phase are disintegration and dissolution, which are dependent on the drug form. So for example, if I take a tablet, the tablet has to break apart once it gets to the stomach or the duodenum. And then after it breaks apart, it has to be able to dissolve in the stomach fluid so it can be absorbed and transported to other tissues or cells in the body. So the breakdown is known as the disintegration and the dissolution is it breaking up further into tiny particles so it can be immersed. So for example, when you have a sugar cube, okay, when you put that sugar cube in water, it breaks down into tiny particles and then it dissolves in the water so you can't even see the particles. And when you drink it, you don't really see the sugar particles, but you can taste the sugar in that water. That is dissolution. However, note that the pharmaceutic phase is dependent on the route of administration and the type of medication or the form of medication. There are many different routes that an individual can ingest a drug. You have the oral, which is taking it by mouth, swallowing. You have the intramuscular, where you use a needle and you inject it into a muscle. You have the intravenous, which is infusing or injecting the medication into a vein. You have the sublingual, which is placing the medication under the tongue. You have the buccal, which is placing the medication in the buccal cavity. Um, and also you have the intradermal. So depending on what route you use, the drug might not go through the pharmaceutic phase. The pharmaceutic phase is mainly for drugs that are in solid form. After the pharmaceutic phase, the next phase is the pharmacokinetic phase. The term pharmacokinetics is de derived from two Greek words, pharmacon, which means drug or poison, and then kinesis, which is motion such as kinetic motion or kinetic energy. Pharmacokinetics is the movement of a drug to achieve the intended action. So the process determines the concentration of a drug at its site of action and thereby determine the time and intensity um, for that particular drug. By applying the knowledge of pharmacokinetics, we can help the drug to be more effective and also increase its benefits while limiting the harm to the patient. There are four main processes that um, has to do with pharmacokinetics. These are absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. And at each of these phases, the drug undergoes further breakdown or further processing so it can be useful in the body. 
drugs must move across membranes into cells before they can be absorbed and the pharmaceutic phase helps break down the drug to begin the pharmacokinetics phase. Drugs cross membranes by either passing through pores or channels by undergoing transport or by penetrating the membrane directly. For most drugs, movement through the body is dependent on the drug's ability to, mem to penetrate membranes directly. Membranes are composed of layers of cells which consist of a phospholipid bilayer. These layers regulate what goes in and out of the cell. It's like a gate when you walk in your door. If you don't have a key, you cannot go in or out of your house. And so these membranes act as a gating system and they regulate what can come in and what can go out. So for most drugs, as I said, movement through the body is dependent on the drug's ability to penetrate membranes directly. Most drugs are too large to pass through channels or pores, and so they require a transport system. And most drugs also lack a transport system to help them cross all the membranes that separate them from their site of action. So with each cell, there is a specific membrane that the cell has. And so if, say, the drug has to travel from the stomach to the kidneys for it to have its intended action, the drug has to have a transport system that will be able to transport them all the way from the stomach to the kidneys and then for it to be metabolized and excreted. So dissolution actually helps the drugs to cross the membranes. And a general rule in chemistry stats, states that likes will dissolve likes. So polar will dissolve polar, nonpolar will dissolve nonpolar ions. Cell membranes are made up of primarily phospholipids. And so for a drug to be able to penetrate, the drug must also be a lipid. And this is what we call lipophilic, means lipid lichen. Um, and this helps the drug to transport or to be transported through the cell membrane. And so with that being said, to cross membranes, most drugs must dissolve directly into the lipid bilayer of the membrane. And accordingly, whereas lipid-soluble drugs can cross membranes easily, drugs that are polar or ionized cannot because they are not lipophilic or they don't like lipids. So ions have to also cross the lipid membrane. And there are different types of ions. You have the quaternary ammonium compounds, which are molecules that contain at least one atom of nitrogen and carry a positive charge. You don't have to really stress about knowing all these types of ions. Just know that ionized compounds or drugs have a harder time crossing the cell membrane, so they are most likely to use a transport system. And knowing this is probably all that you have to know about this. There are different types of transport systems, but the most common ones include the P-glycoprotein. The P-glycoprotein is a transmembrane protein that transports a wide variety of drugs out of the cell. It can be found in the liver, kidney, placenta, and brain. And this is a transport system that basically facilitates the movement of drugs into and out of the cell.
So after the drug has been transported, then it moves on to the next phase, which is absorption. Absorption is defined as the movement of a drug from its site of administration into the blood. Absorption is enhanced by rapid drug dissolution. So if a drug can dissolve rapidly, then it can be absorbed pretty quickly. High lipid solubility of the drug and also a large surface area for absorption. So the stomach or the intestines have a high, a high or large surface area. And so that is why most medications can be taken orally. If there is also a high blood flow to the site of administration, such as profuse capillary beds, then the drugs are going to be absorbed pretty quickly. As such, the form of the medication and the route can greatly affect the effectiveness of a particular type of drug. So let us now explore routes that are used for administering medications. We talked about some of these earlier, but I just want to stress on. Commonly used routes of administration include the intravenous route. Intravenous route of administration is injecting the medication through an IV, whether you give it as an infusion or an IV push. IV administration has several advantages. Because it enters the bloodstream immediately, it has a rapid onset, and so the time of response is shorter. It is precise, and you can control the amount that is entering the bloodstream. So you can give a specific dose. It is suitable for large volumes of fluid. So if I have to give say a thousand milliliters of an IV solution, the best route would be the IV. And it's also suitable for drugs that are irritants or that irritate. Some drugs are really painful when you give it IM. Giving it IV may decrease the chances of that irritation and so the IV route is preferable. However, the IV administration also has several disadvantages. First of all, it is very costly because if I have to give an IV injection or IV infusion, I have to get all the supplies, including the syringes, the needles, and the alcohol to wipe the site, or if I have to give it as an infusion, I have to put an IV in the patient, and I also have to get tubing, a pump. So all these add up to the cost. It is also inconvenient because the patient cannot take it at home leisurely. There has to be a skilled personnel who would administer this type of medication. There is the danger also posed by irreversibility. Once a medication gets into the bloodstream, it is hard to reverse its actions unless we use another medication. And it also has the potential for fluid overload. Fluid overload is just excess fluid volume in the blood vessels. And also it has the potential for infection um, because if you don't take care of the IV site very well, then you will end up with an infection at the site. And it can also cause an air embolism, um, such as when you use tunneled or peripherally inserted catheters. And so all these are very, very critical when we are considering what type of route we will use. The intramuscular administration site is when you put the medication into a muscle and from your 
anatomy and physiology class, you learn about the different muscle masses. And so you can use the deltoid or any other muscle. And it has two advantages. It's suitable for drugs and suitable for depot preparation. So you can give a medication in small doses into the IM site. However, there are some disadvantages. Once again, there is the inconvenience because the patient or the client may not be able to do this on their own. And also, there is the potential for discomfort because IM injections can be very painful. If you ever had a shot when you were a child or even prior to getting to nursing school, you are required to get some vaccinations. You will realize that after the nurse gave you that shot, it was very sore and uncomfortable. So that is one of the disadvantages of using an IM route. We also have the subcutaneous route. And the subcutaneous is injecting a medication in the fat under the skin. This is different from intradermal, as in intradermal you put the medication right under the skin. So subcutaneous, you are injecting the medication into the fat under the skin, such as the adipose tissue. It has similar advantages to IM and the same disadvantages as the IM also. So you can also experience some discomfort when you use your um, subcutaneous injection or mode of administration. Then you have the oral, which is taking the medication by mouth. It has many advantages such as the ease of use. You can give the pill to the patient for them to take home. They can travel with it when they are getting out of time. And so it's very convenient. Oral forms of medications are also some of the cheapest medications that you can find. And it's mostly the safest because it can easily be reversed when it is taken in large quantities. Or for example, if an accidental overdose okay, it is easy to reverse the action of a PO medication than it will be if it was an IV medication. So, with this being said, there are also some disadvantages um, with the PO administration. And this is because there is a high variability and possible inactivation by stomach acid. Depending on when, how the medication was taken, and depending on the individual, the patient's makeup, biological makeup, the action of the drug can be affected. Digestive enzymes can also affect that medication, and also liver enzymes will affect the potency of the medication because oral drugs must pass through the liver before reaching general circulation and we will talk about this. This is known as the first pass effect. And so this will affect the medication or the drug that is available to be used for the intended action. Oral medications can also come in different forms. And these include your enteric coated medications, tablets, and sustained release preparations. The forms of the oral tablets or the forms of the oral medications can also affect the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of the medication. And we will explore that further as we progress um, in this session. Usually, enteric-coated oral formulations are designed to release their contents 
in the small intestines, not in the stomach. So they are meant to bypass the stomach. And then once they get to the small intestines, they undergo the dissolution process and then absorption. Sustained release oral formulations are also designed to release their contents slowly, permitting a longer interval between doses. This means you cannot crash any of these two medications because you will inadvertently um, change the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the medication. So if you have an enteric coated medication or a sustained release, make sure you do not crash those medications when you are giving it to your patient. There are additional routes of administration that you can use for drugs, and this includes topical, which is your skin. I'm just putting the medication on the skin of the patient. There can also be a transdermal, which normally comes in a patch that you put on the skin. So I don't know if you have traveled by sea or gone on a cruise and you have had a scopolamine patch. That is a transdermal patch. You can have pain patch, patches and other forms of um, transdermal applications also. You can also have an inhaled type of medication such as when you have a condition like asthma. You have an inhaler that you can take to help you. And then you can also have it as a rectal suppository or a vaginal suppository where you insert it in the rectum or the vagina to help it dissolve and be absorbed over there. And there is also direct injection to a specific site. For example, you can inject directly into the synovious fluid of the joints and also the heart muscle or nerves and into the spine or central nervous system. So all these are the different forms of route that a medication can be administered. Once a medication has been absorbed, then the process of distribution begins. And distribution is defined as the movement of drugs from the blood into the interstitial space or tissues and cells. So from your anatomy, you learn the difference between tissues and cells, and you know we have extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. So when the drug gets to the interstitial space between the cells and tissues, then distribution is taking place. In most tissues, drugs can easily leave the vasculature through spaces between the cells that compose the capillary wall. And this blood flow determines the rate of delivery of the medication. So if there is low regional blood flow, then it's going to affect the medication being um, transported into the cells, which means there is going to be less effectiveness. If there is pus, which is not blood, um, pus is just an infectious um, fluid, that is accumulated in an area, then that is going to also limit the distribution of that particular drug. And if there are any tumors which has decreased vasculature or limited blood supply, then there is going to also be a decrease of the distribution of the drug, which will affect everything um, from the pharmacokinetics to the time of response because it's not getting to the intended site. Typical, typically, when you have capillary beds, they are highly vascular, and they also have fluids between them, and drugs pass between the capillary cells rather than through the cells themselves. Okay, so, Some drugs must enter the cells to reach the site of action because they have to be where the particular disease is.
for it to be effective. But most drugs can enter cells to undergo metabolism and excretion. And so if there are cells, then the drug has to be able to get there for it to be processed. For example, drugs that are metabolized by the liver has to get to the liver cells for the drug to be metabolized or activated. And this is why it is important that you have good circulation to these areas. There is also the blood-brain barrier. So the term blood-brain barrier refers to the presence of tight junctions between the cells that compose capillary walls in the central nervous system. Because of this barrier, drugs must pass through the cells of the capillary wall rather than between the cells to reach the central nervous system. And sometimes this is dependent on the type of medication. Some medications are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and some medication are not able to pass through um, the capillary walls to get to the central nervous system and so depending on what the intended action of the drug is we may want it to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier or we may not want it to cross the blood-brain barrier so only drugs that are lipid soluble or that have a transport system can cross the blood-brain barrier to a significant degree, so to the degree where it can actually be effective. And so if we or the provider is ordering a drug, he or she will have to consider these factors. Do I want it to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier and get to the central nervous system? or do I not want it? Another thing that um, should be considered is also if the drug is able to cross the placental membrane or not. The membranes of the placenta do not constitute an absolute barrier to the passage of drugs. And so drugs have to be used carefully in pregnant patients because we don't want it to have the same effect it will have on the mother, on the baby. So the same factors that determine drug movement across all other membranes determine the movement of drugs across the placenta. And the risk of drug transfer could be in birth defects, such as mental retardation and gross malformations, such as the loss of limbs, and there are many conditions that can be linked to drugs that have crossed the placental membrane and entered into the fetus and caused anomalies. We can also see this in illicit drugs as well, such as the use of cocaine, um, meth, and other things because it contributes to low birth weight. And we will talk about this more when you get to your third level causes. So if mothers use habitual opioids such as morphine or Percocet, the baby or the fetus when he or she is born is going to be dependent on that particular drug because these drugs are able to cross the placental membrane. And that is why it's very important to consider all these factors. The extent of use of a particular drug when you are prescribing and when you as the nurse are administering medications because you can also always question why the provider is giving that type of medication to a client if you know that client is not supposed to get that medication. So as I said previously many drugs have to enter the cell through the cell membrane and many of them will do that by binding with a protein. Many drugs bind reversibly to plasma or albumin. Albumin is a, a, a type of protein. So plasma albumin is the protein that helps with drug transport. While bound to albumin, drug molecules cannot leave the vascular system. 
the portion of the drug that is bound is known as the inactive drug and then the portion that remains unbound is the free or active drug. There are certain things that can affect this. Only free drugs are active and can cause a pharmacologic response. So if a protein binds with a drug and transports it to the site where it is needed, when it gets there, that bond should be able to break easily so that there will be a free drug for it to cause its intended action. If the drug still remains bound to the protein, then there are not going to be any active forms of the drug to actually cause a pharmacologic response. With that being said, low protein levels also decrease the number of protein binding sites and this can cause an increase in the amount of free drug in the plasma. With drug overdose as a possible result if there are a lot of free drugs. And so think about your patients that have low protein or that have some illnesses that is causing them to um, to lose weight and, and to have low proteins in the plasma. That means that they don't have enough protein to transport these drugs to where they need to. And also, this is going to end up causing more free drugs to be in the plasma. And these drugs can be um, can create a potential harm to, to the patient because it causes an overdose. There is too much plasma concentration of that particular drug. After drug distribution, then the drug has to be metabolized. And so the process of metabolism begins. Most drugs or most drug metabolism takes place in the liver and is catalyzed by the cytochrome P450 system of enzymes. You don't have to memorize this. Just know that most drugs metabolize in the liver, okay? So these, the metabolism is defined as the enzymatic alteration of the drug structure so it can be used by the intended site. And once this occurs, then the drug is either used or excreted. And so we will talk about the next phase of pharmacokinetics, which will be the excretion. It is important for drugs to be metabolized because we need to be able to excrete the medications or the drugs we take in. And so once a drug is metabolized or when the drug undergoes metabolism, then it helps the renal system to excrete it. This is the most important consequence of drug metabolism. Through the conversion of lipid soluble drugs into more polar forms, it can be therefore filtered through the glomerular filtration of the renal system and be excreted in the form of urine. Other consequences of drug metabolism are conversion of drugs to less active forms or inactive forms, conversion of the drugs to more active forms so the body can use it, and then conversion of some of the drugs to their um, non-toxic or more toxic forms. So depending on what the intended action is, metabolism actually helps with the use of the medication or drug and also with the excretion of the excess that was not used by the body. Some drugs can induce or stimulate synthesis of hepatic drug metabolizing enzymes and thereby can accelerate their own metabolism and the metabolism of other drugs. 
this affects the amount of drug that is going to be available after metabolism, which is also known as the bioavailability. So bioavailability is the amount of drug that is present in the body to be used after metabolism. And this is affected by the age of the patient. So for example, when you have an infant, say, less than one year old, because all the body systems are not fully developed, they are only going to require very low doses. And that is why we prescribe or administer medications to infants and children according to their weight because we don't want to create an overdose situation. It is also affected by the enzymes. If you have digestive enzymes or enzymes that breaks medications such as the enzymes in the liver that we talked about, then the drug is going to be readily available. If you don't have enough, then it is not going to be metabolized well, and so you have a lesser amount. The nutritional status of the individual is also important. Remember we talked about the fact that if you have low protein, then there wouldn't be enough protein for the drug to bind with to be transported. And so that is going to affect the amount of drug that is available after metabolism. And also competition for binding sites. Okay, so if I have two medication or two drugs that are competing for the same type of protein to bind with, then I'm going to end up with having less protein for each of these two drugs. It's the same thing with other body processes. So if I have a drug competing to bind to the same sites, a certain protein is supposed to bind to, then I'm going to have a reduced amount of protein sites, which will affect the amount of medication or drug that is available. So the first pass effect refers to the rapid inactivation of some oral drugs as they pass through the liver. And almost all oral medications go through the first pass effect. And so you will see some variations when you begin your clinical that if I have the same type of drug, okay, so let's talk about morphine. If I am prescribing morphine or if I'm administering morphine in a tablet form, usually the patient is going to need a higher dose than if I was giving it IV. Why? This is because the oral tablet has to undergo the first pass effect. And so the amount of drug that is left after the first pass effect is going to be less. For us, when I give it in the IV, it is going directly into the bloodstream and so there is no first pass effect. This explains why the oral dose has to be higher than the IV dose to achieve the same action. And finally, after the drug has been absorbed, metabolized and used, then the body has to get rid of that particular drug. So drugs and their metabolites can exit the body through urine, sweat, saliva, breast milk, or through the air we breathe out. However, most drugs are excreted by the kidneys. And so renal drug excretion has three steps. You have the glomerular filtration. This is a system, it's like a funnel with a tube that try to filter everything that um, has to come out in your urine. We will talk about this more when we talk about um, the renal system and some of the disease that affect the renal system. Okay, You don't have to know these processes, but just know that most medications are excreted from 
or by the kidneys. So these, once again, are the steps that um, the drug goes through in the renal system. You don't have to be particularly focused about that, okay? Drugs that are highly lipid soluble undergo extensive passive reabsorption into the blood and therefore cannot be excreted by the kidneys until they have been converted to a more polar form by the liver. And that is why we said the liver is very key to metabolizing the medication from non-polar forms to polar forms so it can be filtered. There are other forms of excretion that occur with respect to drugs and these can be through the breast milk and so when we are prescribing a medication to a lactating mother we should consider whether the drug can be excreted in the breast milk because if it's excreted in the breast milk then it means the baby is going to ingest it and is going to have um, a pharmacologic effect on the baby and so we have to be really careful because it can pose a threat to nursing infants. It can also be excreted through bowel and the lungs, especially for um, certain types of anesthesia, and also sweat and saliva in small amounts. So you will find that some medications will cause the sweat color and also the composition of the sweat to change um, and we will come across some of the examples as we progress through our pharmacology class. For most drugs a direct correlation exists between the level of drug in the plasma and the intensity of therapeutic and toxic effect. This is known as the time cause of drug response. So the higher the plasma concentration, usually the higher the drug response. And this is based on whether the drug is a sing single dose time cause, the half-life of the particular drug, and also if the drug levels produced with repeated dose, if the, there were repeated doses to produce the effect of that medication. So the minimum effective concentration is defined as the plasma drug level below which therapeutic effects will not occur. So the minimum effective concentration in other words is the amount of medication that will cause the intended pharmacologic response. So for example, if I need, say, two spoons of sugar to make a cup of water sweet, if I put one spoon of sugar in that water or cup of water, that is not going to be enough for me to taste the effect of the sugar in the water. And so the minimum amount of sugar I need for that one cup of water is going to be two spoons of sugar. And after two spoons, I should have the intended consequence, which will be the ability to taste that particular, um, the, the sugar in the water, okay? And so each drug has a therapeutic range and the therapeutic range of the drug lies between the minimum effective concentration and the toxic concentration. The toxic concentration is the point at which the plasma drug level becomes harmful to the patient. So I know two spoons of sugar will make my cup of water sweet, but if I put 10, spoons of sugar in the same cup of water is going to be too concentrated and at that time 
it is going to be overpowering for me. And so that is the toxic concentration. The amount of the medication in the plasma level or in the plasma that will cause a harmful effect. So the objective of drug dosing is to maintain plasma drug levels within therapeutic range. However, the therapeutic range is dependent on the drug's minimum effective concentration and also the toxic concentration. The wider the distance between the minimum effective concentration and the toxic concentration, the more easy or the relatively easy it is to use the drug safely. So in other words, if the drug has a wide therapeutic range, then it's generally going to be safe because you have enough room to change or alter the dosages. However, if the drug has a narrow therapeutic range, then it is going to be difficult to use and is going to be probably unsafe. And you will have to monitor this very closely to prevent overdose. The duration of effect is determined largely by a combination of metabolism and excretion. And so if you are also going to use the drug as a single dose time course, then you have to look at the levels of this medication. So levels rise after absorption and declines with metabolism and excretion. And to maintain a therapeutic response, the drug level must be constantly above the minimum effective dose. The dosing of any drug is based on its half-life, and the half-life determines the dose frequency or the amount of the drug that will maintain a constant level above the minimum effective concentration. So let's talk about the half-life. The half-life of a medication is defined as the time required for half the amount of that drug to decline or to be out of the body. So, for example, if I give you 500 milligrams of Tylenol, the amount of time it would take for you to get rid of 250 milligrams of that Tylenol will be the half-life of the Tylenol. So let's make an example. Let's just say that the therapeutic dose of Tylenol or the therapeutic level is 300, okay? And then it takes four hours for 250 milligrams of Tylenol to be excreted from the body. So the half-life of Tylenol is four hours. If the therapeutic dose is 300, it means that at every four hour interval, I have to have at least 300 milligrams of Tylenol in the body. And so, when I take 500 milligrams at 8 o'clock, by 12 p.m., I'm going to only have 250 in the system, which will be lower than the therapeutic level. With that said, it means that I have to take Tylenol every four hours to make sure that I have the amount I need in the body.
when drugs are administered repeatedly, their levels will gradually rise and then reach a steady plateau. So drugs that have short half-lives must be administered more frequently than drugs that have a longer half-life. Okay. The time required to reach a plateau is equivalent to about four half-lives. And this is why we have some medications that have to have a loading dose. The time required to reach the plateau is also in independent of the dosage, although the plateau is higher with larger doses. This means that if I have a certain drug or medication, I have to give it consistently for a certain amount of time before it reaches a plateau. The plateau is the level where the drug action is stabilized. If plasma drug levels fluctuate too much between doses, the fluctuation could be reduced by giving smaller doses at shorter intervals, thereby keeping a consistent amount in the plasma. Keeping the total daily dose the same will also help keep a consistent amount in the plasma. And using a continuous infusion or using what we call a depot preparation. For a drug with a long half-life, a loading dose may be needed to achieve that plateau quickly. So when I have a drug that has a half-life of, say, a full day, it means that I will need a loading dose and then subsequent doses to be able to achieve the plateau to where there is a consistent amount of drug in the bloodstream. When drug administration is discontinued, most of the drug in the body is eliminated over four half-lives. So when you take Tylenol, it is going to take about four times the half-life. So if the half-life is four hours, it means that it is going to take 16 hours before 94% of the Tylenol leaves the body. And this is why for certain medications that we will learn about, you will realize that we have to stop the medication days before a procedure because the half-life is longer and also it takes a longer time for most of the drug to be excreted so that the potency is reduced. So go ahead and answer these questions. These are sample questions that will help you to see whether you have really internalized what we have discussed in this under this session or not. The answers are posted in the PowerPoint notes. If you have any other questions, please let me know or let your faculty know and we will be more than happy to explain things further to you. Now let's recap what we have learned today. Okay, we have learned that there is no such thing as an ideal drug when it comes to its selectivity, safety, and effectiveness. If a drug is not effective, then we shouldn't be giving it. So when you give a medication for pain, such as Tylenol to a patient, 
and you reassess the patient and the patient is still in pain, then it means that particular drug is probably not effective for the patient. And for that matter, we should contact the provider so that he or she will review the patient's medications and probably change it. If a medication is not safe, then we shouldn't be also giving it. So when you are giving a medication to your patient, you should assess the patient and make sure that that patient can take that medication. For example, if I have a patient that has liver disease and I'm giving Tylenol to that patient, I should check the liver function to make sure that this patient can metabolize the Tylenol and that the Tylenol is not going to be harmful to the patient in the long run or in the short term. We have also learned that medications undergo several processes before it becomes available for its intended action. And this is affected by the availability of binding sites. And also it is affected by the age and certain characteristics of the patient. We have also learned that after a medication is used, the body has to be able to excrete it. And the way the body excretes all drugs is that it metabolizes them into polar substances or ions where it can readily be filtered by the kidneys. But there are also other forms of excretion that can occur, such as through the breast milk and also the skin and even the air we breathe out. And so when we are monitoring the action of a drug as nurses, we should be considering all these factors and asking ourselves, is this drug beneficial for my particular patient? Will the patient be able to metabolize and excrete this drug? Are their liver functions and kidney functions okay? Do they have any conditions that prevent them from using this type of medication? And after we have considered all these, then we can make an informed decision as to what to expect from the action of the drug and then what education to provide to the patient. Our next session is going to focus on pharmacodynamics and we will talk more about the processes that a medication goes through and how it affects the body. And we will also be talking about the intended consequences of taking a drug and the unintended consequences of taking the drug, such as the side effects or the harmful or adverse effects. Thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope you will use this to prepare for class and I'm looking forward to you being fully engaged in the in-class activities that we have prepared for you. See you soon.